Hartford. He's going to be coming around. He's been Dr. Jeremy Smith, one of our new advisory council members, and he's going to be speaking on how God preserved his word in the Old Testament. So, PowerPoint presentation. Dr. Smith, where was Amen. Well, it's good to be here. First, let me just say thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've really enjoyed my time here. This is my first time at one of these meetings, and I've learned a lot in the past Amen. day. And what a blessing all the speakers have been to me, this church has been to me. I want to say thank you as a bit of um, just uh, um, covering some bases. I've got some Bible pages out there um, for you all to look at. They cover the history of the Bible from the 15th century all the way up to 1611. And uh, if y'all are interested in looking at them, please t- um, go over there. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And um, I think you might enjoy taking some time and looking at those. So let me encourage you to do so after the meeting or during a break. Um, as I said, my name is Jeremy Smith. And um, we're going to be talking today about how God preserved His Word in the Old Testament. About two years ago, Newsweek um, came out with an article. I'm sure some of y'all had seen this article when it came out. Um, the title on the cover was, The Bible, So Misunderstood, It's a Sin. And uh, I would agree with that. <laughs> Many people misunderstand the Bible. I agree with that. But when we get into it, um, the man who wrote it, um, his name was Eichenwald, he made this statement. He said, no television preacher has ever read the Bible. Neither has any evangelical politician. Neither, neither has the Pope. Neither have I and neither have you. At best, we've all read a bad translation. A translation of translations of translations of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies and on and on hundreds of times. And then he made the statement, the Bible is a human book. Now, we're going to be talking about um, how do we solve the issue of this? And the basis for this is the doctrine of preservation. It's not just enough that God inspired His Word, but we also have to see that God not only inspired His Word, but thought enough about His Word to preserve it. Yes. I always bring this up many times. Um, a few years back, you remember when um, our former president, George W. Bush, was running for a second term? There were some um, news reports that came out that um, made claims of things that he did and things that he said that weren't true. And um, what did the President of the United States do? He um, combated it. He um, stood up against it. He refuted it. And it cost one of the major anchors in our country at the time, a man by the name of Dan Rather, it costed him his job because of the misrepresentation of what he did and what he said. Now, that's the President of the United States. I've seen in articles, um, the National Enquirer, it says such and such a Hollywood star had such and such as baby or had an alien's baby and crazy things like that. And many times when these stories come out, even the Hollywood stars will sue these papers for claiming that they said something that they didn't say. If the President of the United States and a Hollywood star thinks enough about their word to defend it, even if they're not that special or important a person in, in who they are, Don't you think God would think enough of His Word to defend it, to preserve it, and make sure that what we read today is what He had said? I believe that's the truth. And before we can go forward, I want to just tell you why I am not King James only. Now that may not go well, but first, y'all just hear me out here. Let me tell you why I am not King James only. Number one, I am not King James only because the King James translators were inspired. They were not inspired. Uh, Many people teach a doctrine or a teaching called secondary inspiration. Let me first say that secondary inspiration means you do not believe in preservation. There is no need for a secondary inspiration if God has preserved His Word. Number two, I am not King James only because the KJV is superior or corrects the Greek New Testament. No, the King James is a translation of the Greek New Testament. And it is not superior. At best, it can be equal to. It cannot be superior to the Greek text. Next, um, I am not King James only because the KJV is the only translation in the world to have the perfectly preserved Word of God. I believe that every um, people, every tongue needs to have a Bible that's translated from the original languages. Now, I understand from time to time there may be need to translate from the King James because, let's say, we want to have the Bible in their language and we don't have the education or something like that in order to put it in Greek or Hebrew. However, the ultimate goal must always be in every tongue. 
to have a Bible that's translated from the original languages. Now, let me tell you why I am King James only. I am King James only because the KJV is the last English translation to come solely from the correct Hebrew and Greek text. And by the way, when I say that, I'm not talking about somebody who did it for their doctoral thesis or somebody that did it in their basis, I mean, their basement. But in every one of these things, when we look at them, every translation that's come out since 1611, every one of them has been based on the critical text, on the Alexandrian text, and not solely on the correct Masoretic and Byzantine majority text or the Texas Receptus, as you would want to call it. Also, thus, it is the last English translation to uphold the doctrine of preservation. Now, I'm going to ask you three questions before we get into this because I want to make sure everyone in the room is on the same page. I know most of you all in here are experts in this field, but some of you all, you're not experts. And before we get into this, I want you to answer some questions in your mind, and I hope this will be a blessing to you before we get into it so we can understand better how God preserved His Word. The first question is this. Is the Bible a divinely inspired book or a natural book? Now, when I was um, going to Tennessee Temple University, my very first theology class, the professor of that class, he was the head of the missions department at Tennessee Temple, he began the class with the Bible, and one of the first things he said was that the Bible is a, a book that goes through natural processes just like any other book. And I had a problem with that. In effect, when he was done, he said this. He said the only inerrant inspired word that we had was in the original languages. I mean, the original manuscripts. The Bible we have today has errors because it's a book that goes through natural processes. It is a natural book. I had a problem with that. So does the Bible... Does the Bible teach that it is a divinely inspired book or a supernatural book? Or does it teach that it is a simple natural book? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Number one, we learn from the Bible that the Bible had many writers. But pay attention to this. It is all God's Word. Amen. What does the Bible say in Matthew 4.4? 4? Somebody quoted this last night. Um, but Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, notice the last statement, that proceedeth out of the what? Mouth of God. Now, we look here, we see a picture of Moses carrying the tables of the law. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. But whose words were they? God's Word. Every, I mean, the Bible had many writers. Moses, Isaiah, they were greatly intelligent men. They were well-educated men, those two. But then he had some simple writers. I think of Amos. That, um, that herder and the um, gatherer of sycamore fruit. He said, I was not a prophet, neither was I the son of a prophet. He said, I never even went to Bible school. But the Lord called me and told me a message, and I've given it to you today. He uses all types, but even though there were many writers, it is all God's Word. Number two, of the many biblical persons who wrote down God's Word, one of them was God Himself. Did you know that? The Bible says in Exodus 24, 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Now, no other book in the world can claim to have as one of its writers God Himself. This is a special book. And finally, the Bible also tells us it's a supernatural book. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick. That means alive and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. No other book can possibly make that claim. Yes, the Bible is a supernatural book. The Bible is a divinely inspired book. All right, our next question. What is the Word of God? The Scriptures in the original tongues or a faithful translation? I've heard many people when they were speaking, uh, many people in my classes teach that if you did not know the Hebrew or the Greek, you really did not know the Word of God. Many preachers will get up there and they'll hold these things as if they were um, lording over them some secret that they are just blessing you by giving a little bit out of. But what does the Bible teach? Is it the original tongues or a faithful translation? And what's the answer? The answer is both. And the Bible teaches us that. Let me show you. 
If you would, let's take out our Bibles for a minute. I want you to look and turn to Isaiah chapter number 61. Isaiah chapter number 61. You're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah 61. However, I'm going to read another passage at the same time. I'm going to read Luke 18, I mean Luke 4, 18 and 19. I want you to look at Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, as I read Luke 4, verse number 18. I'll begin there. Look on as you find the passage. The Bible says in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, you were looking at from chapter 61 of Isaiah, verses 1 and 2. i got a question for you. Did they read perfectly alike? No, they didn't, did they? There were a little bit of differences. Yet, Jesus right here is quoting Isaiah chapter number 61. Why do they not read alike? And the answer is this. In Luke, Luke is giving us a Greek translation of the passage in Hebrew. That's what he's doing. Now, they don't read alike. Not 100% alike. They're not word perfect as we used to learn when we were growing up in church. So let me ask you a question then. Which one is the inspired Word of God? The answer is both, correct? And here the Bible illustrates to us that you can have confidence that your translation is the Word of God if it is faithful to the original text. You do not have to know Greek or Hebrew. By the way, I've taken Greek. I've taken a little bit of Hebrew. I think it's good for you to learn those things. There's nothing wrong with it. But no one has to go through the rigmarole of learning all of those things to understand God's Word and to have confidence that what they have in their hand is the Word of God. Let's go forward. Passages that teach the perfect preservation of God's Word. Isaiah 48. We're going to go through these very quickly. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Psalms 12.6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalms 119.140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33. These were um, quoted last um, yesterday. These are the only three verses in the Gospels that are word perfect. They are the only three places where the same words are given word perfect in each of these three Gospels. There is no other verse that's like this. These are the words of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. Now, notice the use of the word words. He didn't say my word shall not pass away. Why, if he had said that, you may get the idea maybe that what we're talking about is the idea of what he's saying. The thought of what he's saying. But he didn't say that. What he used was the plural form. Words. And that shows us that God preserves not just the thought, but every one of his words. The whole Bible. So now let's look at how God preserved His Word in the Old Testament. Now we're looking at the Old Testament. I want to give you the reason why. Understand this about the Old Testament and understand this about the New Testament. The Old Testament took over 1,000 years to be put together and to be written down. It covers over 1,000 years of history. However, the New Testament, at the most, given the longest range, covers 50 years. And if you look at 50 years, you don't have many opportunities to show instances of preservation in that type of span. However, in the Old Testament, due to the fact that it covers over a thousand years, we see several instances where it shows us how God preserved His Word in the Old Testament. We'll first look at Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 and 26. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of the writing of the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Did you see what he did when he finished 
the book of Deuteronomy. He takes the law, and I personally believe it's all five books. And what does he do with those books? He puts them where? In the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the question may be, it says in the side of the ark. Some scholars may say there was a side compartment on there. I don't necessarily believe that's true. Nonetheless, he put it in the body of the Ark of the Covenant. Think of it this way. Not only was Aaron's rod that budded, the pot of manna and stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments, not only were they stored and preserved in the Ark of God, but also the Bible was preserved in it as well. We go a little bit further to Joshua chapter 24. Verse 26, the Bible says, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Notice it says that he wrote these words where? In the book of where? The law of God. What is the law of God? What is the law? Genesis through Deuteronomy. In other words, the Bible they had at that time. When Joshua wrote the sixth book of the Bible, the Bible says that he had put it in the book of the law of God. In other words, he attached the book of Joshua to the Pentateuch. He attaches it to that book. This shows us that the book of Joshua was as inspired as Genesis through Deuteronomy. After they were written in the book of the law of God, they were returned into the side of the Ark of the Covenant. As other early books of the Old Testament canon was written, it would be correctly assumed as they were recognized as inspired works that those were also placed in the Ark as well. Now, consider the Ark of the Covenant for a minute and what kind of special box it was. The Bible tells us this, by placing the Word of God in the Ark of the Covenant, it was under the care and protection of God Himself and not men. Hey, do we understand how possessive God was of the Ark of the Covenant? He took some pretty drastic actions about how people handled it, didn't He? We don't have a lot of time, but you know this story from 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. God slayed 50,070 men of the town of Beth Shemesh for mishandling the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Philistines stole the Ark? They take it and they had a lot of trouble for having the Ark. You remember all the trouble they got in? They bring it back. They bring it back with two, um, two cows that did not have their kids, so they started bellowing and making a lot of noise so everybody could hear this cart coming when it came back into Israel. The Levites find it and they said, Hey, this is the Ark of the Covenant. One of them says to the other, You know what? I've never seen the pot of manna. Wouldn't it be neat to see Aaron's rod that budded? How about we just take a look inside and see what's in there? And you know what they did? They tried to crack open the Ark. And what happened? God killed every one of them that tried to do that. God took the ark very seriously. More famously, we know the story of how God slayed Uzzah for just touching the ark. Understand this. God wanted it to be left alone. And God wanted those things that He put in there to be preserved and to be a witness to the children of Israel, not just in the time of Moses, but also in the time of Joshua, also in the time of David, all the way up, as long as that ark was there. Now, how does this fit into the teaching of the preservation of the Word of God? Well, by the time we get to 2 Kings chapter 22, we find a problem. The temple is in horrible disrepair. It needs a lot of work to be done on it. The Bible tells the story of some of them going into the temple and they could see the sun shining through the ceiling of the temple. I mean, the temple had not been taken care of. Not only had the temple not been taken care of, but by this time, they had lost the Word of God. Could you imagine that? After all the persecutions and after all the kings that stood against God, at one point during that time, a portion of the Word of God, or maybe even all the Word of God, had been lost in Israel. They had no copy of it. But the Bible says at this time, they begin to do work on the temple. And as they're doing work on the temple, guess what? They find the Word of God. Um, due to time, I'm not going to read this entire passage, but if you'll look there in um, 2 Kings 22, 8-11, you'll see the event. Um, I'll read the very end. It says, And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king of, his, of Judah had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. He realized he had not been serving the Lord the way he should, and it broke his heart that he had not done it. However, where did they find the Word after they had lost it? Where? In the temple. 
Now, in the description of the temple, we never actually find a place in the temple where it says they laid the Word of God out. You have a table of showbread. You have the seven, um, the seven golden candlesticks. You have the altar of incense. But no place that I see in the Bible do you see a place where it said they laid the Word of God in the temple. Except for one place. Where was that? Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. If there's holes in the temple in the holy place, let me tell you, there's holes in the Holy of Holies. Now, some people would say, well, they couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies. That's not necessarily the case. After all, in the tabernacle, when the Holy of Holies was there, what did they do when they broke the tabernacle down and carried it someplace? Guess what? They had to go into the Holy of Holies and remove the Ark of the Covenant so they could move it to their next place. There were times and events where it would be considered all right. And to repair the temple, that would be something that was understood. They go in there and they find it. We learn this. The fact that these were preserved by God Himself and not man, paid off for mankind in 2 Kings 22.11. Understand this. If man was responsible to keep the Word of God, we would have lost it then. It would have been gone. In this passage, we find out that man had lost the book of the law. As they were repairing the damage to the temple, as I said before, they found it. And the Bible says this, As the priests were repairing the Holy of Holies, they came upon the lost Word of God. The only reason why they were able to find God's Word, and why we still have it, is not due to man, but due to God. Let's look at another place. This is our final thing we'll look at. How does God preserve His Word in the Old Testament? We see another instance in Jeremiah chapter 36. Do me a favor and turn to this chapter if you don't mind. Very important chapter in the book of Jeremiah. Due to um, sake of time, I've um, cut out a lot of verses. Um, We're going to read the main verses of this passage. Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 10, the Bible says, Then read Baruch in the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate, of the Lord's house in the ears of all the people. And it came to pass when Jehudah had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. So understand this. Baruch gives the book of Jeremiah, at least all of Jeremiah that had been completed. Let me just say Jeremiah 1 through 35, okay? He brings it and tells the king to read it. But the message that Jeremiah is delivering is not a message that the king likes. So he begins to hear the message. As they read, Jehudi takes a penknife out and starts cutting up the leaves after he reads three or four of them and throws them in the fire. Now, there hasn't been another copy of Jeremiah. This is the original manuscript, as they would say, okay? This is the original manuscript. And what is he doing to it? After three or four pages... Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 10, all the way to Jeremiah 35 is cut up and burned. Oh no. This is the inspired Word of God. What are we going to do? We have lost the original manuscripts. What are we going to do? Well, the Bible teaches that the Lord had a plan. Look at verse 27. The Bible says, Then the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burned the roll, and the word which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. Then took Jeremiah another roll, and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So let me explain to you what this is talking about. God tells him to write 1 through 35 again. And guess what he does? He writes Jeremiah 1 through 35. Now, some people point out at the very end it says that he wrote all the words, but it also says that he added words. Well, yes, he did. You know what that was? Chapter 36. To tell him why he was doing it. <laughs> and then on and on to the end. Of course, he added more words. Jeremiah is at 35 chapters long. However, every word that was torn up and burned. God had Jeremiah right again. Now, how many of y'all have memorized the book of Jeremiah? Anybody quote it word perfect? I sure can't. I don't know really, could Jeremiah, did he memorize it after he wrote it? No. So how in the world could he have written every single word? 
that had been given before. Well, the Bible tells us how he did it. We see that Jeremiah 10, 36, 10 through 32 shows us that just as every word is inspired by God, every word is to be preserved. When Jehoiakim cut up and burned what had been written in the book of Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah to write every word he had previously written. Pay attention to this, all the words. In other words, word for word. How did he do that? John 14, 25 and 26 tells us how that happened. Jesus was talking to the disciples. And he gives a very interesting statement here. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Now pay attention to the next statement. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So how was Jeremiah able to write, again, word for word, Jeremiah 1 through 35? The Holy Spirit of God moved on him to write those words again. Jeremiah did not have to memorize it. Why? It's God's Word. God told him again what to write. Then Jeremiah wrote the rest of the book that bears his name. So we see right here that we see great illustrations in the Old Testament of how God preserved His Word. God takes preservation very seriously. He wants to ensure to each and every one of us that the Word we hold in our hands today in the King James Bible is the Word of God that was delivered to the prophets and delivered to the apostles and were a blessing not only to the church of the 21st century, but also the church of the 1st century. It is meant for us to read. It's meant for us to treasure. It is a supernatural book. It is the Word of God. And I hope that what you'll learn from this presentation and from the presentations to come is how much we need to read and value and treasure God's Word. Amen? God bless you. Oh, yeah.